Ooh, today's Father's Day, if you didn't catch that memo already. And you may remember some of you from Mother's Day. I'm not a big fan of these obligatory holidays because it's complicated. It can be complicated. I don't like being told what I'm supposed to think or feel or do on any particular day. And I know that not everybody had super awesome dads like I did. And um, so sometimes it's complicated. And I can tell you, I made the mistake of trying to go try out at a church and have my talk be on this Father's Day that followed the year my dad died. That was a bad choice. Because we'll just say it wasn't very good. <laughs> It was, it's okay, because I didn't really want to move to Minnesota. I wanted to move here. But it can be complicated, these holidays. So, and because I know that, because I've had conversations with people and heard stories, I have a difficult time generalizing and say, well, all dads are like this, which is often what you hear when you hear messages about these particular holidays um, because not everybody's experience is the same. Every single person's experience is different. And so instead of trying to make a broad assumption about things, which just happens if you try to go buy a card at the card store, yeah. Um, I asked you all to tell me some stories about your dad. So instead of telling a broad story, I could tell specific stories about dads. And so the stories I heard were stories of tenacity and compassion and love. Pretty good stories I got. And so I think that one of the best ways that we can honor those who have come before us, whether they're still alive or whether they've passed on, is to take the lessons that we've learned from those people in our lives and pass them on and improve them and make those part of our own lives. What are those qualities? So we're going to start with Sheila's dad. She said, I'm going to tell you what she wrote. She said, he quit school in the eighth grade to work and help take care of his mother and two siblings because they were so poor. He always wanted to be a doctor and fishermen and locals let him remove fishing hooks and stitch them up on many occasions. Ow. Uh, he was a farmer, carpenter, mechanic, equipment operator, horseshoer, horse trainer, his own veterinarian, and built the first service station and garage at the corner of Fireweed and New Seward. That's tenacity and courage. In all of those things are especially, I suppose, required if you're um, pioneering the last frontier, right? And I like that idea of like, oh, okay, something needs to happen. We'll just figure it out and do it. That's sort of the, the attitude I grew up with in, in, um, in my home. But it wasn't, he wasn't just a making things happen kind of guy, which it sounds like from all those things that he did, he certainly was. He was also a very sweet and thoughtful and loving kind of dad because Sheila went on to write about how when she was in college, she knew this guy and he wanted her to marry him and go off and be in the Peace Corps for two years and, and have an, that kind of adventure. And she wasn't sure if she knew what love was. And so she asked her dad for advice. And this is the letter that he wrote back to her. Honey, now I must tell you what real love is, and I have, fa and have found it. Love is everywhere, like the seed of mustard, and under proper condition, it grows. Love is the seed of a beautiful perennial flower. It will start from a seed stimulated with the caresses of raindrops and the warming breezes of spring. Mothered by the sunshine, these things will grow, start it to grow, but what we must give it soil, good soil, to root itself into. Root well the feeding grounds and foundations because it will winter and weather many storms. All these make it stronger and more beautiful. 
more resistance to anything that might attack it or feed upon it or destroy it. Love is like that exactly. Without these equals, it will winter and die to be destroyed by the storm of a lover's quarrel or the lack of attention. Each kind word, each caress, each loving smile or tear feeds this love. Each misunderstanding that is corrected makes feed that grow that makes it grow stronger. If one part of the plant weakens, the other part, if cared for right, will grow all the stronger and will seem to carry the load of blossoms until the other part is back to health. Many a plant starts, but in love any more, it seems like few really finish. The longer a plant grows and the more care it has, the more beautiful the plant of love will be. I hope your plant will you, to you and yours be the most beautiful in the world. Dad wisdom. From the same guy who's taking fishing hooks out of people and sewing them back up. So, pretty broad brush. We're going to paint our dad wisdom in. That's not the person she ended up marrying, by the way, if you didn't catch that. But he didn't tell her not to. He just said, he just, I mean, was a, how beautiful is that? Understanding and wisdom. And then Nancy told me about her dad. <clears throat> Nancy's dad was uh, injured in the World War II. And so he could have stayed home and lived off disability. But he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to have that life. And so... It was hard for him to get a job, but he found a job as an elevator operator, which really wasn't his preference, but that's what he was doing. And one day somebody said, well, you like this job? And he said, not really. And then he ended up getting another job, a better job, in the Office of Records. Plans and Reprint. Blueprint room. Yes, in the blueprint room. And he ended up becoming a supervisor. And he ended up finding a job that he could do and feel well with. And made enough money to send Nancy and her siblings to college. Tenacity. Courage. And, I mean, I think that for, for someone to say, well, what do you think about this job? You could be like, it's very nice, thank you. And he was like, no, not really. <laughs> but then she told me another story. Because I like, you know, that's a nice story. She told me another story about when she first had learned to drive. <laughs> and um, she, it was Vermont, and, and they, they have some complicated road situations like we do in the wintertime. And uh, she had, I don't remember if you were avoiding or something or if you just ended up in a ditch or a snowbank or black ice. Black ice. Yeah. <laughs> um, she didn't hit the car, but she hit the snowbank. And her dad was on his way home from work with a friend riding the other direction and he saw her and stopped. And he didn't lose it. He just took care of her, compassion, and made her drive back, back home. Because you gotta get back up on that thing that scares you, compassion. <sighs> and I, I like these stories. I was grateful because these stories reflect a lot of my experiences of my own father. And so, even though we're not generalizing, we're saying these particular stories are that because not everybody's stories are that. But that's how we would like, where we'd like to go. And so, and we're going to get into this, the complicated part. It can be complicated. Because in many traditions... People relate God to a father figure. And for some of the reasons I've already said about it's not everybody having a great dad experience, this can be problematic. Now, if you had a dad like mine or Sheila's or Nancy's, you'd be like, that kind of works. I can work with that. But not everybody had that dad. So that's number one why it's complicated. But number two why it's complicated to equate 
God to a father figure, I think, is because to limit God to the attributes of a human and to a gender misses out on so much. But some folks resist this idea of God being the universal energy that is in and through everything, the one presence and one power in our universe, because it seems so impersonal. Dad seems very personal and close. So let me suggest that God can be both as big as all that is, as the whole universe and everything in it, and even bigger than all of that, and as close and personal as your breath. Both. And those great qualities that we find inspiration in from Nancy's and Sheila's dads, such as wisdom and imagination and tenacity and compassion and love, those are all ways of being that we can aspire to re reflect in our own lives, right? But they're not attached to males only. And so we can take that learning beyond beyond a personal anthropomorphized God concept. What if we realize that the closest experiences we have of spirit or God, whatever you want to call it, and all that is it is our best expressions of divine wisdom. Our closest experiences are when we are expressing and witnessing other people expressing their highest version of a, one of those divine ideas that we talk about all the time. Wisdom, love, imagination, joy. It goes on and on. Abundance. Let's all express our most divine way of abundance all the time, right? So we experience spirit in our prayer times and in each other. We sometimes think we have to only, that's where we go to meet God in that time. But what if we walked the earth knowing that all moments are God moments? That seems very intimate to me. Like I said, all that is, one presence and one power of everything, and yet also right here, as close as the next breath. Because if God is everywhere, through everything, if spirit is everywhere, through everything, then here's that moment too, right? So I said at the beginning that the best one of the best ways for us to honor our loved ones whether they've moved on or they're still here, is to express those divine qualities. What inspires you about a person? You know, they say that old saying, if you spot it, you got it. So if you really admire the uh, tenacity or the wisdom of someone, that's probably because that's something in you that you have as well, maybe wanting to call forth more. Think about it. It's true. Uh... So usually the things that annoy you about somebody also are the things that annoy you about yourself. Oops. Sorry. You didn't want to hear that. So when we see that in someone, I think that's the best legacy we can have. And it's not only for people, maybe our fathers, maybe someone else who's inspired us in our lives to say, you know, I saw this, this compassion in this person and that really inspired me. So I want to do more of that to best express who I am. Well, if we don't know someone who expresses something, but we think that that's really who we want to be, well, it's a divine idea, right? So then it is there and all that is, and that is our inspiration. So whether you are calling forth to follow in the footsteps or calling forth to expand on the imagination of your father, the joy of your mother, or another divine quality straight from the direct oneness that we experience that is God, spirit, divine mind, fill in the blank, whatever you want to call it. 
go forth and express your best.